All right, now in, um, I'm going to get back to 1 John chapter 4 in a minute. We're going to do something a little bit different tonight. I don't, I don't really go too often to, to outside sources or doing other things, but um, just follow me with this because I'm gonna, I'm gonna, there's going to be a point to this. You'll see real quickly what it is. There's a, there's a few quotes here from a, from a very famous person in history. Okay? And I want you guys to sit there and think if you can figure out who this is. And maybe you know this, maybe not. But um, there are a few quotes here. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna read the quotes before I tell you who this person is. Okay? And this is going back a little bit. This is back in like 1800s. He said, "I have no purpose to introduce political and social equality between the white and black races. I, as well as Judge Douglas, am in favor of the race to which I belong." having the superior position. He added, free them, talking about slaves, and make them politi politically and socially our equals? There's a question. My own feelings will not admit of this. We cannot then make them equals. He also said, what I would most desire would be the separation of the white and black races. And he vowed, I will to the very last stand by the law of this state which forbids the marrying of white people with Negroes. Okay. Sounds a little racist, doesn't it? Just a little bit? That was Abraham Lincoln. All those quotes were Abraham Lincoln. Now, I actually didn't even plan this at all, but I think tomorrow was President's Day. <laughs> but it wasn't, it wasn't planned out as I was kind of ironic because I was, I was just coming up with this. Now, here's... My whole point with all this is that, you know, some people might know the history of this, but a lot of people don't, okay? And what, what the whole sermon, what we're going to be focusing on is questioning everything, questioning what you believe, why you believe it, where did you hear it from, and not just accepting things as fact that you've been brought up with. Because false doctrines and false beliefs get steeped in people from a very young age, and it can be very hard to overcome these things with the truth and because you're lied to. Now, growing up, I mean, Abraham Lincoln was put on so high of a pedestal. Basically, there's like George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. Those are like, like if you know any U.S. presidents, like you know those two. And both of them are lifted up extremely high, exalted, extolled, you know, whatever. And every time you hear about Lincoln, he freed the slaves. He freed the slaves. He was against slavery. He was vehemently against slavery. He's such a great guy. He's against slavery, right? And we see here, I mean, he wasn't that great of a, you know, he was definitely a racist, okay? And a lot of things, and I'm not going to do a history lesson today, but just a few key facts, because I, I, I use this because I think, like, a lot of people have, have learned this and, and have heard it growing up, so it should be able to relate to everybody. Um, he was a politician, first and foremost. He was a president, and he was definitely a politician, Okay. He said a lot of things to make different people happy and to make other people happy, but ultimately, you look at the Civil War, and you know people look at, oh, the Emancipation Proclamation, he freed the slaves. No, read it carefully. Because he didn't just free all slaves everywhere. What he did was, because he was in the war, and this was like years into the war, it wasn't about slavery, it was about getting the taxation from the southern states. But what he did was, hey, I got an idea, we need some help, let's make a declaration to free the slaves that are, that are on the opposing side. And just say, hey, you guys are free and basically come and fight for us against them. You know, like he, he was just, he was using this as a tool to help him win the war. And it wasn't about freeing the slaves. If you look at it, the declaration didn't free the slaves in the union. He was only specifically freeing the slaves that were in the rebel states that were that were rebelling that they were going to war with it he it was not this this thing about he was making this great stand and and here's the thing okay that's is all as far as i want to get into that because we're at church we're not doing a history lesson today look into that for yourself but the whole point is just to say wow i think a lot of people hear that and be like that's not what i was taught at all in school growing up my entire life not once is that ever mentioned but all those quotes that I read, those are quotes. I did some fact-checking on this because I don't like to just say things that are just completely false. All those quotes I looked up and found from multiple sources. And these are transcripts 
That's where he said it was um, a debate with him and Judge Douglas at the time. So, like, this is recorded. This is fact. These are statements that he made. And it's true. But you, don't, you know what? You don't hear about that in, in classroom. There's a lot of things that are, that are sheltered and shielded. And honestly, quite honestly, you know, that Civil War was a big deal because that just abolished states' rights and their right to secede from the Union. I mean, he went to war with them just because they wanted to pull out of the Union, which completely defies the whole founding of this country in general, that the states came together to form the federal government, and at any time they have the right to be able to withdraw from that agreement that they made when they formed the Union. And he just squashed that completely and just said, no, if you want to leave, we're going to come with guns and tanks and we're going to go to war with you and, and just kill you into submission until you come back and you're going to be forced to be part of this union. And that's what happened. And now, I mean, a lot of bad things have happened since then, but that was kind of a, a setting off point of, a, of a, a really bad precedent to set in this country. But um, in any case, you know, whatever the reason is, okay, there's an agenda behind the history that we learn about, about the, the history that we learn whether it be Abraham Lincoln or whether it be anything. There's an agenda behind it. Now, I'm not going to claim to know what all the agendas are and why people lie. I mean, there's, there's lots of reasons for it, but it doesn't matter. The fact is we have to understand that this is going on, first of all. And not to just accept anything that you hear or read or you've been taught as just being blatant, as just being fact. Okay? We live in a world today, especially more than ever, where people are being brainwashed and conditioned into believing a lie, into believing all kinds of lies. Now, it's happening through the public education system, has been completely taken over. Again, that started off with just local communities, local groups saying, hey, instead of all, everyone teaching their own kids, let's just group some of them together, especially ones that are maybe similar in age, and we'll just have one person teach them. It's just kind of efficient, then you freeze up time to do other things, whatever it may be. That's how it started, and then it grows into being part of the government, the government's paying for it, and all of a sudden, you know, you're going to be required to have all your kids go to this school and stuff, and it's just gone out of control. But basically, public education these days, I mean, if it's funded by the state, the state's determining the curriculum, the state's going to determine what they want to indoctrinate the children with. What is the truth? They're, they're determining what's the truth. And when you don't, when you send your children to these government-run institutions, you're just relying on them that they're going to teach your children the truth. Now, I've already found many falsehoods that I've been taught growing up more than enough to, to know that I don't want to send any of my children to get that type of brainwashing because it's going on. And it's not just hitting people through the public education system. It's also hitting people through Hollywood. Um, I've gone into that many times in sermons on just, just the sin alone and the desensitizing us to so many different things, but it's desensitizing us not even just to sin, but to so many other programs and plans that, that the people in power want to, want to um, do and, and what they want to um, deceive the public into just accepting or believing. And these, these forces are out there. You know, a lot of people will hear what I'm saying right now and be like, wow, where's your tinfoil hat? You're a kook. You're nuts to think that this stuff is going on. And they're just blindly just, just accepting, just like, nobody's out to hurt me. There are no hidden agendas. There's no such thing as a conspiracy. There's no such thing as people who want to, you know, make a slave out of you or anything like that. And they're going to call me nuts. And you know what? Fine. Just keep on sleeping. Just don't wake up ever. Because it's ridiculous at this point to say that there's no such thing or just call me a conspiracy theorist. I mean, you look at things like 9-11, like and it's so clear to see the agenda behind it. All the liberties, all the freedoms have been stripped away from this country because of this event. And I'm sorry, if you look at Building 7, you can see a controlled demolition, a building that fell at free fall speed. All the science is there showing that there's no way it could have happened the way that the government tells you that it happened. It's impossible. There's, there's, just, there's just scientific fact proving that it cannot happen the way that it was told us that, was gonna, that it did happen. So the government, of course, is going to lie to you. Everyone should know that by now. The government lies. Big surprise, right? Hollywood lies to you. It's nothing but a bunch of deceivers on the screen. And it's all for an agenda. It's all for a point. It, it's all, there's an agenda behind it. Again, I don't know what all the agendas are, but there's a lot of wicked people in, in high places. I'm gonna, I was going to get to this later, but I'm just going to read the verse now. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 
verse 11 says, But put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That exists. That's the Bible. It says that that's the way it is in this world. And that is the way it is. That there are, that's what we fight against. It's the wiles of the devil. Ultimately, it's the devils behind all of the, the wickedness and the spiritual wickedness in high places. It says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. This isn't a physical fight. But it's against principalities and powers. There are some extremely wicked people in power that are the rulers of the darkness of this world. And to, to turn a blind eye and to think that that doesn't exist is just foolishness. It's out there. There are extremely wicked, bad people out there that are trying to lie to you, that are trying to deceive you, that don't want you to know the truth, that want to keep you in darkness. But that's why the Bible says, Wherefore, <clears throat> take unto you the whole armor of God. We need to be girded with the armor of God to stand against the wiles of the, of the devil. It says, That ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. And this is what I'm, kind of, I'm going to be emphasizing tonight is just the truth and knowing the truth and being able to question everything that you hear so that you can just know and discern what is the truth and what is not the truth. The first thing, the first part of the armor that we're supposed to have is having your loins girt about with truth. It's important that we have the truth because you see there is an enemy. We have an enemy today. There's someone out to deceive you and it's the devil. There's a war going on but it's not a physical one. It's one of principalities and powers. It's a, it's a war of ideas, and it's a war to, to, to get you to accept things and to believe certain things and to keep you in darkness and not to know the truth. The Bible says in John 8, 44, it says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. Again, even in Jesus' time, he's talking to people who are children of the devil, wicked people. Um, a lot of these people were Pharisees. And others that were just, they were wicked people. It's the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. The devil has no truth in him whatsoever. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. There are people that are children of the devil. The devil is the father of all lies. He's, he's, the, he's a liar and the father of it. He does not want you to know the truth. He does not want people to know the truth and get saved. He wants to keep us in darkness and enslave us. I mean, that's the way you do it. When you can control what people think, you can enslave them if you can just control, you know, what they believe and what they think. It's a way to control people. And we need to be aware of the wiles of the devil, gird our loins with the truth, make sure we know the truth, and that we're not being deceived by falsehoods. Now, we're here tonight at Word of Truth Baptist Church. I chose that name for a very specific reason, because we're interested in just knowing what is the truth. It's all, I mean, we want to know what is it. We care about the truth from God's Word. God's Word is truth. We know that this book has the truth that we want, and we want to hear all of it. We want to study all of it, learn all of God's truth, and we don't care who disagrees with us, who agrees with us. It doesn't matter. As long as we know what the truth is, the truth is going to make us free. The Bible says in John 8.31, it says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If the truth is going to make you free, that means you were in bondage. Now this is saying, he was already talking to people that believed on him. That's where he opened up in verse 31. It says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. They were already saved. They believed on him. And he said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Not everyone that's, that's a believer, not everyone that's saved is a disciple. A disciple is someone who follows Jesus Christ. A disciple is someone who listens to what Jesus Christ has to say and obeys it and does what's right. Not everyone's a disciple. But he says, if, you want, if you're my disciple, if you continue in my word, you shall know the truth. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is truth. He embodies truth. His word is truth. And if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you shall know the truth. He said, the truth shall make you free. Nobody likes to be in bondage. 
Unfortunately, a lot of times people don't even realize they're in bondage. When you're mentally enslaved, when people have got you so deceived and so tricked, they trick you into thinking that you're free. When you don't even realize you're not free at all. They've changed the definitions on you into making you just think that you are free because they tell you that you're free. And, um, and you're not. But if you know the truth, you study the Bible, you become a disciple of Jesus Christ, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. See, first you have to understand what the problem is and how, to, and, and how to go about fixing it in order to become free. And you need the truth for that. Now, um, it's your job to learn and to judge what you hear, to be able to separate the truth from lies. And this is a big task. This is something, and this is the whole point of the sermon. I want to help you to try to identify what's true, identify what's right, and be able to separate lies from truth to the point where, I mean, you need to be questioning me. You need to be questioning anything you hear from anybody. Just the, the majority of your learning ought to be from your own Bible reading. We have, you have the truth. It's written in these pages. You have the ability. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit residing inside you. The Holy Ghost will teach you. The Holy Ghost will teach you the truth from God's Word. He'll do it. Now, it doesn't mean we shouldn't come to church. We already talked about that this morning, about forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. You know, God has ordained prophets and teachers to help teach and explain and expound the Bible. It's biblical. It's a biblical way of learning. But at the same time, you have to not believe everything you hear just because you hear it or just because you're in church or just because this person said so. You have to learn it for yourself. You have to just study and make sure that what you're hearing is true. And here's where I would recommend for anybody. Now, I didn't, always, I didn't do this very much in church. But I think it's a good thing to do would be to take notes of the things that you hear in church and write down the scriptures. And then when you go home, you can look them up for yourself and have a little bit more time because a lot of times we can blow through some stuff really fast. And I might mention a few verses and then move on to the next point. But if you're not sure about that thing, you write it down and be like, you know, I'm going to look into that a little bit later. Because I've never, maybe it's something you've never heard before. Maybe it's something that, that you believe differently before. And you hear something be like, you know, I want to check that out. It's a really good idea. Just, hey, keep a pen and a notebook handy and just write down these things so that you can look them up later. And you can know the truth and just not just blindly accept what's being fed to you. No one ought to just blindly accept what they're being fed. The only thing we can blindly accept is the Bible as being God's word and being the truth. And, um, but you should already have that established. Now, in 1 John 4, that's, this, this is where we started 1 John chapter 4, look at verse number 1. The Bible is telling us here, it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. This is exactly what the whole point of the sermon is. We need to try the spirits. That means test them, try them, whether they are of God. It is what I'm hearing coming from God. I don't know, it says, the reason why we have to be aware of that is because many false prophets are going out into the world. There's not just one or two. There are many false prophets going out into the world. And we need to be aware of this. We need to not believe every spirit, but try the spirits. Verse number two, hereby know ye the spirit of God. So here's one way to know if someone's preaching by the spirit of God or not. It says every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Now at this time, there wasn't really many people preaching about Jesus Christ other than people who would be the Jews. So at that point, especially, there was, there was a sect where you either believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, or you did not believe that Jesus Christ was Messiah. And there really wasn't much of anything in between. There wasn't I don't, like, at least not right away, um, people who are saying, like, right now we got this whole spectrum of a lot of people who will claim Jesus Christ, but they're adding works, they're doing all these other things, and really, and really screwing it up. But he's saying, look, if they're saying, if someone's saying that Jesus Christ is not come in the flesh, you know right away they're not of God. Okay, so today there's a religion that believes that Christ has not come in the flesh. That's a Jew, the, the Jews' religion, the religion of Judaism. They are not of God. You know, a lot there's there's actually Christian churches that will invite rabbis to come in 
and speak to the church, and they think that you're going to learn something special from this rabbi, from this, from this Jewish priest that comes in, and that's false. As he's not of God. If, he, if he's not going to believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh, it's not of God. Look at verse number four. It says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. So again, another, another test is when a preacher... When the world hears a preacher, when the world, and we always hear them, like, they're okay with what he's saying, they accept it, they believe it, and they'll just embrace him. Okay, when the world accepts somebody like that, they're probably not of God. That's another very strong indicator. When you have a very famous preacher, like a Billy Graham or a Joel Osteen, that they don't say anything to offend anybody. They're just saying nothing. And they're accepted and believed and revered by the world. The world accepts them. The world embraces them. The world will say, yeah, yeah, we'll put you in a TV spot and just let you talk to everybody. And the world is okay with it. That's not of God. Look at verse number six. It says, we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. So again, basically, people who are saved are going to be able to hear the Bible and understand God's word. They're going to understand when there's, you know, when there's a preacher that's, that's, that's speaking the truth. And if you're of God, you're going to be able to hear, you're going to be able to receive knowledge from the Bible, you're going to be able to understand that. But if you're not of God... You're not going to be able to hear that. You're not going to understand that. See, a lot, of, a lot of people, people who are unsaved, they don't understand the Bible. The Bible is something that's spiritually discerned. It takes the spirit to help you to understand that. And if people are unsaved, they don't have the spirit that's there to guide them and to help them understand it. So, so many people you run into that are not saved, they'll just say like, I am just totally confused by the Bible. I don't understand it at all. It just makes no sense to me whatsoever. And I remember reading the Bible before I got saved. And I felt the same exact way. You just read words and you just, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, you can see some things, you can learn some things, you can learn some history, but you don't understand it. You don't get it. You're not, you're not getting the truths of the Bible. And you need to have that veil removed from your eyes once you get saved to then be able to understand and, and see what the Bible is even saying and just to know what the truth is. Don't take anything for granted. Try not to accept anything, like I mentioned earlier, just because, well, well, that's what everybody else believes, right? So they say, well, we go to an independent fundamental Baptist church, and all independent fundamental Baptist churches believe this or do this, so that's what we believe too. Not a good reason whatsoever. Or, well, that's just what I've been told my whole life. That's what I've been taught my whole life. No, you should make every belief that you have your belief. It should be something that you personally believe, not just something you were taught. Don't just pawn it off and say, like, well, that's just what my pastor taught me. Take it upon yourself to learn. Take it upon yourself to study and know for yourself what the Bible says. It's not good enough just to rely on what someone else is showing you or teaching you. You ought to make that belief your own. And it's the same way, I mean, even with salvation, in order for someone to be saved, they, need, they can hear all day long what salvation is. They can understand it. They could, they could get it, you know, just, just see that. But... In order for them to be saved, that belief has to be their belief. They have to put their faith in Christ. The same way with any doctrine that you hear, anything that you hear in church, look, it's one thing to hear, it's one thing to understand and to get what's being taught, but make that your belief if that's what you believe. But decide what you believe and decide if what you're hearing is true. You need to be able to compare it with the Bible. In order to be able to do that, you need to know the Bible. You need to get in the Bible. Acts chapter 17 Verse 10 says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women which were Greeks, and of men not a few. So here we see, you know, the, the people of Berea, I brought this up in sermons in the past, it says they were more noble than those in Thessalonica that they searched the scriptures daily. 
daily. I mean, they were being taught daily. They searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. And as a result, because they did that, because they searched the scriptures and made sure that what they were being told was the truth, it says in verse 12, therefore, many of them believed. See, they searched it out for themselves. They heard it. They heard the truth. They said, you know what? I'm not just going to blindly accept what you're telling me. I'm going to look up for myself. Look it up. You know what? That is what it says. And many of them believed because they searched, because they made it their belief, because they said, you know what? I've seen it for myself. I see what the book says. I see what, what the Bible says. And unfortunately, though, there's a lot of people today that are not getting saved because they're clinging to their religion. They're clinging to what they've been brought up with. So many, man, so many people I talk to, they're just like, you know, they're not interested in hearing the truth as much as they are just in their heritage. Just, well, my whole family's Catholic. And that's, and that's a common one, is the Catholicism. Just, like, people just, they treat that as, like, their culture, as just, like, their heritage. Just, this is what I've been brought up with, this is what I know, and this is what I'm going to die as. I mean, Mormons are the same way. There's so many, there's so many people like that. I mean, you could probably go down the list of just about anyone. I mean, I've talked to just about some in, in, in every denomination that's even close to it. Or Muslims the same way, right? Well, I've been, I've been brought up this way. This is what I've been taught my whole life. This is what my parents believe. This is what my uncles believe. This is what my sister believes. This is what my brother believes. This is what everybody in my family believes. So I'm going to believe them. Or people will say, oh, yeah, I, I don't need to hear anything about Jesus. My, uh, my uncle's a pastor. And I hear that all the time, too. Like, yeah. It's like, well, you think you're saved because your uncle's a pastor? It's like they're just relying on what other people say, what other people believe, and they're just too lazy to, or, or whatever. I don't even know if it's laziness to, to figure it out for themselves, but they just don't want to deal with it, and they're just comfortable in the sense of just, of just being surrounded with people that believe the same thing. And you know what? Maybe that is comforting, but it's foolish. You might feel comfortable just because you're surrounded by a lot of people that are agreeing with you, a lot of people that, that, that are believing the same way as you, but if you're deceived, it's foolishness. There's no, you know, you ought to just want to know what the truth is. And that's why I was saying, I don't care if everybody else in the entire world believes differently. If, as long as I know what the truth is, then that's what I want to believe. And I know that that's not the case for anything that I believe, that there's, there's plenty of other people that believe the same way. But it's not the point. The point is not how many people believe a certain thing. The point is, what's the truth? And what's right. So don't let this, just because other people believe a certain thing, dictate what you believe. Now you ought to be able to question what you believe and figure it out. But then once you figure it out, and, and figure it out, don't just, don't just put it off and just like, and just never look into things. Figure out what you believe. And then get settled on it. I mean, there's certain things that are fundamentals in what I believe. I mean, there's certain things that I do not need to look into anymore at all. The King James Bible being the Word of God, I have looked into that a lot for myself. I don't need to keep looking into that anymore. I'm settled on that. Salvation by grace through faith, yeah, I don't need to hear any more about that or, you know, to learn any more about what and, and figure out what I believe. I know what I believe in that. And there's certain fundamentals and there's things. And see, these are the things that you need to form as the foundation and the core for your belief. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3, 14, it says, But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, this is saying, look, if you're saved, you have a hope inside of you, you have a hope of your salvation, you should be ready to give an answer to anybody that asks you about that. You should be ready to answer them. And that's talk, I believe this is talking about salvation, but I think that you ought to be able to do that for anything that you believe. Whether it's regarding salvation or not, I think we all ought to be able to, to explain to someone, why do you believe so, you know, this and so doctrine or whatever it is? Why do you believe that? Know for yourself. Be able to just explain and say, you know what, I believe that because the Bible says, you know, quote a verse or be able to show them or, or even if you don't have it memorized, you know, you should at least know, like, well, I know the Bible says, you know, this. And I don't know, I mean, even if you don't know exactly where it is, now we ought to, you know, the goal would be to, to learn where everything is. But, 
you know, you should still at least know why you believe what you believe, is what I'm saying. I mean, even if you don't have it memorized, even if you don't have the exact reference, <clears throat> you should be able to know why you believe what you believe. Now, don't take the sermon the wrong way either. I want to throw this in here because I do think it is important to be taught by others. I think it's important to come to church. So what I'm saying is just don't blindly accept what people say as being true or just be, or being a fact just because of who's telling you or who it's coming from. You ought to be able to question everything. Now, I'm often prevent, presented with varying views on the Bible. And I'll tell you right now, I haven't studied every single thing that's in the Bible. I haven't studied every single topic out because there's a lot in the Bible. And I haven't studied all of it out, so I'm not an expert in all of Bible doctrine. So when someone presents a case to me and says, you know, and says, hey, check this out, you know, and, and whatever it may be, I'll listen to what they have to say. <coughs> if someone comes to me and says, you know, whatever, hey, I believe this. Well, why do you believe that? I believe it, you know, from the Bible. The Bible says that um, he that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. So, you know, I'll give people a chance. Now, I'm not too proud to have new truths shown to me from the Bible. I'm the person who's like anyone else. I need to learn some more. So if someone has something that they can teach me or show me or where I'm in error, if I'm wrong about something, hey, come and show me. Now, if you're going to try to tell me that salvation is not by grace or faith, I'm settled on that. I am found there's no way you're going to change my mind on that. It's done. It's settled. I have that foundation. Now, I'll listen to people, but when someone wants to teach you something, see, this is where you need that discernment. This is where it's, it's anything that you're maybe a little bit unsure of, you haven't thought about very much, anything that's new, anything that's a little bit contrary to what you've already come to believe. And here's a few tips. Here's what I do when people come to me with this. First, I look and see how much Bible are they using to support their claim. How much is just logic and how much is actual Bible verses? Because a lot of times what people will do with false doctrine is they'll, they'll strip one verse and oftentimes out of context and then just go on and on and on and on and on and on and on just with this full explanation. And then like you find out, well, that's the whole foundation of what they believe is just this one verse and then a huge explanation. It doesn't automatically prove that they're wrong, but it's not very much evidence, not very much weight for me to, to just embrace and say, well, yes, I believe that based on one verse. Well, look at how much Bible... And of course, it has to be the King James Version. If someone's going to come at me with some doctrine or some belief, and they're not even using the King James Version of the Bible, just forget it. Because you don't even have the source of the truth. God's Word is truth, not some corruption or some, some perversion of His Word. That's a lie. So I'm not even going to look at it if you don't come at me with the King James Version. The second, we're going to look at how much Bible they use. Or first, we're going to look at how much Bible they use. Second, I'm going to see, does this teaching contradict anything that I know for sure to be true? These fundamentals that I've come to learn and just embrace, and I know that they're true. I know that the King James Version is the Word of God. I know that salvation is by grace or faith. You know, I know these, these, these certain doctrines. If what they're telling me is, is conflicting with that and contradicting that, it's not true. I'm not going to accept it. I'm not going to believe it because God's Word does not have contradictions. There's no... There's no flaws, there's no error in God's word. And it would be a spirit of error to come and, and bring you something that's going to tell you that like, for example, you know, I, there's a belief out there that says that Christians will go to hell for a thousand years if they don't live good enough in this life. They say, oh yeah, well, you're saved eternally. You know, after the, after the millennial reign of Christ, you'll go to heaven. But for that thousand years, if you're not good enough, if you don't endure unto the end, if you don't do all these works, then you're going to spend a thousand years in hell. That's a false doctrine. I mean, it's a silly false doctrine, but it's but it, there's a lot of people out there that believe that. And it's ridiculousness. And that completely is contrary to so many scriptures. I mean, if someone's telling you something like that, like I have verses that just pop into my head. You know, he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Yet the people of hell are called dead. Okay, there's a contradiction. If, someone, if a Christian's going to be in hell for a thousand years, and, and Jesus said... If, you, if you're living right now and you believe in me, you're never going to die. Well, hell is, is death, okay? And that is just a false doctrine. So I'm just going to look and see, okay, is it contradicting any of the foundations, any of the, the core 
think the doctrines that I believe is what I'm being presented with um, contradicting it. If it does, then you just reject it. Third thing I do, I look at how complicated is the explanation. How many mental acrobats do you need to do to follow? Do you need to have like a whole chart laid out? Do you need to be able to like, you know, really jump around and, 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 and it's so complicated that like, it's just incredibly difficult to understand? Now, most likely if that's the case, it's probably a false doctrine. God is not the author of confusion. God is not trying to, you know, he, he makes things simple for us. Salvation is really simple. His word is really simple. I know there's a lot of things I've been confused about in the past about God's word that I didn't get, I didn't understand. To me, they were complicated. To me, they were confusing. But once I understood them, once I learned them, I was like, oh, that's actually not complicated at all. It's really, really basic and really simple. It was me that just didn't understand. It was making it difficult. But if someone's trying to explain something to you, and it's just, I mean, it's just extremely complicated, most likely it's not of God. Fourth, now if I haven't studied the topic already, then, and, and it passes these other, three, these other three things, then what I'll normally do is I'm going to go and study some more before I come to a conclusion. I'll study on my own. So if someone comes to me and they say, look at this, look at this, look at this, this is what the Bible says, you know, it says here, here, here. If it's something contrary or something I haven't studied very much, I'll receive, I'll listen to what they have to say. If they pass all the other, you know, tests that, that I'm kind of going through in my mind and tests that, that I'm, you know, just judging when I'm hearing what they have to say, then I might have to say, okay, well, I'm going to look at that then. You know, thanks for, for, for showing that to me, but I'm, I'm going to look at it a little bit more. And then that's when you go through and just verify. What were you being told? What scriptures were they going to? And then, because a lot of times, I mean, if, so, if you have a conversation with someone, you don't always have the time to dig in and just read everything in context either. Now, like when we go sewing, we show people specific verses, right? When we're, when we're at the door, we're talking to people, say, you know, look at this verse, look at this verse, and we kind of jump around, we show different verses, and we're, and we're proving our point. There's nothing wrong with doing it. And if someone's trying to show you that, there's not necessarily anything wrong with that either. Because that's just, that's how you kind of compare scripture to scripture. But the problem comes in is when you don't know the context and they're misapplying it. So you can let someone show you that stuff, but then it's important to go back and say, okay, in context is what they were saying. Is that really what this is saying? Because you can make the Bible say a lot of different things. And that's where a lot of false doctrine comes from is from verses just being ripped and twisted out of context. And see, when you're, when you're following the train of thought of what someone's trying to teach you and trying to push on you and trying to show you, it's easier to follow that line of thinking because they're, they're guiding the conversation and they're steering you in the direction that they want you to see the things that, that they're, they're trying to show you, whether it's really there or not. So you, you got to, and this is, it's kind of difficult to do that sometimes when you look at it, and be like, is that really what this is saying? You know, and just read it in context, and um, and that should help you to be able to figure out whether or not you're being told the truth. And ultimately, you have to rely on the discernment of the Spirit and not just blindly accept things. Um, and that's again, that's another reason why I think it's important. You know, when you're when you're in church, it would be a great idea to just take notes. Now, um, so that you could go back and and figure it out for yourself when you get some time at home. And as I mentioned this earlier, but one of the biggest hindrances for people being able to recognize the truth about a matter is tradition. Okay, things have always been done a certain way. Um, you know, and it, this is like that everywhere. Now, not all traditions are even bad. Not all traditions, you know, some traditions are just fine. Some traditions are good. And some traditions are bad. Some traditions are just simply unbiblical. And every church will have this. The Baptist churches have it. I mean, there's a tradition of having an altar call. There's a tradition of, you know, um, some tradition of, tradition of saying the Pledge of Allegiance or, or saying a pledge to the Christian flag or whatever it may be. I mean, those things are all unscriptural. They don't exist in Scripture, but they're oftentimes are just, you know, they're just tradition. And, um, and they're not always bad, but the thing is we need to be able to recognize 
So if someone, if you're in a church and there's a certain tradition that you follow, if someone were to come up to you and say like, hey, this is actually wrong, you know, because X, Y, and Z, whatever it may be, like, hey, saying the Pledge of Allegiance is wrong because why would you pledge your allegiance to the flag? You ought to be pledging your allegiance to God, you know, for example, right? You can say, well, saying the Pledge of Allegiance, that is definitely a tradition of man. Nowhere in the Bible does it talk about pledging your allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, right? That is, that is without a doubt a man-made tradition. Now, if someone were to come to you and say that, be like, hey, this is why this is wrong, and especially with a wicked country like we have right now, the people I'm not going to pledge my allegiance to that flag if I'm told to do something that's wicked. I'm not going to do it. They don't have my allegiance in that case. I'm not going to just blindly pledge my allegiance. So, but if you're in a church like that, and don't just think that, well, this is the way we've always done it, and just bristle, be like, well, you know, and, and make that think that what this verse is saying just can't possibly be true because it's just been a tradition for so long. Well, that's not a valid argument. That's not something that you can use, you know, as, as proof that what you're doing really isn't wrong or it's okay or, or it's right as what you should be doing. Um, Jesus Christ said in Matthew 7, 9, he said, he said unto them, full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. Verse 13 says, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which ye have delivered. And many such like things do ye. When we've been, and the reason I just bring this up is because when we've been um, told, we've been doing things a certain way, taught a certain way for a really long time, especially over years, it's a lot harder to question them and to look at them in a new light. But it's something that we need to be aware of. The Bible says in, in Colossians 2.8, it says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So we need to watch out for philosophy. We need to watch out for vain deceit. We need to watch out for the traditions of men that are, that are after the world. And that they're not after Christ. That's something that we need to be, be aware of. Now, one of the biggest lies that's being taught in the independent fundamentalist churches today is the pre-trib rapture. And this is something that is very difficult to talk to people about because they've been taught a certain way their entire life. They've been taught that, you know, the preacher of rapture is true and that we're going to get out of here, that we're looking for Jesus Christ, he can come at any time. And there's a few verses, a few things that are repeated over and over and over and over. Repetition is key in false doctrine. It's repeated over and over and over again. And pretty soon you just start to accept it and you start to believe it. And... Jesus himself does not want us to be deceived about end times events. It's not something that's extremely difficult. And, and so many people, I know myself included, who look at Revelation and just be like, I don't know what this is talking about at all. But when I thought that, I didn't know much about the Bible at all. Okay, I didn't study the Bible very much at all. I didn't read the Bible. I didn't even read the Bible cover to cover. If you don't even read the Bible, then yeah, there's going to be a lot of things that probably don't make sense to you. You have to actually read it in order for it to make sense to you. But Revelation, you know, is a, is a chapter that a lot of people have problems with, they struggle with, but it's not even that difficult. And Jesus doesn't want us to be deceived about it. He doesn't want us to not understand it, to not know it. Matthew 24 says in verse number 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Excuse me, tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So they're asking Jesus a question. They're saying, hey, look, when is all this stuff going to happen? When is the end of the world going to happen? You know, what's the sign of your coming back? When, you know, Because you, we know you're coming back again. We know the second coming of Christ is coming. It's going to happen. When's that going to happen? What are the signs? When's the end of the world? So he, Jesus answers them in verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. So the first thing he's telling you is say, okay, now pay attention, because I don't want anybody to deceive you. Take heed to yourself. Don't be swallowed up in false doctrine, and people are going to come and teach all kinds of lies, because this is a prophetic thing. This is something that's going to happen in the future. So there's going to be a lot of people that are going to spit out a lot of lies. He says, take heed. Very first thing in his answer, take heed that no man deceive you. Make sure that you're not being tricked. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, 
and shall deceive many. Many people will be deceived, but he, wasn't, he doesn't want his disciples to be deceived. And he says the same exact thing in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says in verse number 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, again, in both of these places, I mean, both of these are talking about end times events. They're talking about end times prophecy. In both places, they say, hey, look, don't let anybody deceive you. Don't be deceived. There's going to be a lot of false teachings out there in the pre-tribulation rapture, teaching that we're just going to be sucked up out of here before any problems happen, before any tribulation comes, is a lie. And it's a falsehood. And it's a tradition of men that's just being repeated over and over again by people who don't know the Bible, don't want to just accept the truth, and they're embracing a lie. Now, he tells us here, and, and the big lie is, I mean, if people, people constantly say, well, Jesus could just come back at any time. Any time at all. Is that what 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says? When he tells you not to be deceived, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. What day? The day of Christ. His second coming. The day of Christ is his second coming when he comes back again. That's the day of Christ. That day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. So some people are going to be like, well, yeah, there is a falling away. Right now, there's a falling away. Whatever. But how about this? And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, is the man of sin, the son of perdition, being revealed? I mean, does anybody know who he is? I mean, if he's been revealed, then tell me who is it, because I want to know. Who is the son of man? Who is the son of man? Or, I mean, I'm sorry, not the son of man, the man of sin. Who is... The man of sin, the son of perdition, that opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. As far as I know, there's nobody sitting in the temple right now in Jerusalem showing himself that he is God. Now, when that happens, okay, then the day of Christ can be at hand. Then I'll believe you at least if you were to say, well, now God, you know, Christ can come at any moment. That makes a lot more sense than it does right now because right now the man of sin has not been revealed. He's not sitting in Jerusalem. He's not sitting in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. It simply isn't there. Which is just, it just goes to prove that there's no way that Jesus Christ can just come back. It's just an imminent return. Okay, and that's that's a big piece of the argument of the of the pre-tribulation rapture. Is basically they're saying, well, the Bible says that no man can know the day or the hour, right? Well, I don't know the day or the hour either, but I know that it's after these events because that's what the Bible says. Because the Bible says, don't be deceived; it can't even happen until these events happen. The Bible says in Matthew twenty-four. We'll continue reading that. Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. All nations. It doesn't say some nations. It doesn't say, well, America is not going to hate Christians. All nations, for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So again, he's saying, all of these other things have to happen first. Everything else that we just read, 
All of that stuff has to happen. Don't be deceived. These things all have to happen. It says in verse 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand, then let him which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Again, this lines up exactly with what we saw in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. The abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Stand in the temple, showing himself that he is God. What we just saw in 2 Thessalonians 2, both places saying, don't be deceived. The end can't happen unless all these things happen. Matthew 24, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, match up perfectly with each other. Until the abomination of desolation stands there, until the son of perdition exalts himself as being God, look, the rapture cannot happen. I'm sorry, it just can't happen. Jesus Christ's second coming, it can't happen. And then it goes on and on and explains um, in verse 23, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false, false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now, I don't know about you, but I also haven't seen any false prophets or false Christ showing so many wonders that if, if it weren't for the fact that I was already saved, that I would be deceived by the wonders that they're doing. I haven't heard about anybody doing wonders like that or anyone being deceived by people doing wonders like that. It's just not happening yet. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together, Everything up to this point is tribulation. That's why verse 29 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the earth shall be shaken, of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That's the rapture. That's when he gathers together his elect. That's when those who are saved, believers in Christ, are going to be raptured up. It's after all of these events. This is all happening in chronological order. We have two places that we just pointed to. So again, I understand that the pre-trib rapture is something that has been taught forever. I mean, not forever, but like, you know, in a person's lifetime, you might have been growing up in a Baptist church and have heard this all your life. And that's just what's being taught in certain places. But just because it's being taught doesn't make it true. Okay? Compare the scripture with the scripture. Use that. And, and you know what? I don't expect you to just be converted immediately after hearing like a short sermon on this. And I show you two places. It's just something you've been taught your entire life. But don't just write it off. Okay? Look into this and dig into it for yourself. If it's something that you haven't heard before, or if it's something you haven't studied very much before, if you're not founded, if you just don't know, if it's not a fundamental thing, if it's not foundational, that you've already just know all the answers to and you could and you could you know it forwards and backwards, then look into it. And and look up at these verses and see what and you know and see what the Bible says. And um, you know the if you got the Holy Spirit inside of you, you know, don't be bullheaded, don't don't um, don't be too proud, be humble enough to just accept it. And again, we all ought to have that humility. Humility is such an important attribute. In the Christian life, I mentioned it this morning, that's how we take heed lest we fall into sin, is to make sure we're humbled. It's also a way to make sure we can continue learning the Bible, that we never get to a point to where I think where you think, I know everything about the Bible. Nobody can teach me anything because I just know so much. No, you need to be humble. Now, you ought not let yourself get deceived, but at the same time, you have to be humble enough to be able to receive instruction, to be able to receive a correction. And... and just to learn something new. And um, hopefully hopefully the sermon helped you a little bit to, to, to be able to sink in and just, you know what, we, I really need to study more. I really need to just question the things that I hear. Don't blindly, I don't want anybody, I, 
I don't ever want anybody to come to this church and just blindly accept the things that I preach. That is not my goal whatsoever. I'm here. I, I want to teach you the full truth, and, I, and hopefully everything that I preach will be true and be accurate and be correct and be right. And I want you to be able to, you know, I want you to be able to trust me with what I'm saying. But I also want you to look up everything for yourself and decide for yourself if what it's true. Because that's more important is, is your own personal validation with God, with His Word, and with the Holy Ghost inside of you. Let's bow our heads of word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the Bible. I thank you for giving us the blessing of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, dear Lord, to teach us your Word and to just instruct us and to guide us, dear God. And um, that we don't have to go to man to understand your Word. That you can teach us yourself through the Holy Bible. And... Um, but I pray that you please help us to be diligent, help us to be steadfast, dear Lord, help us to be um, not easily deceived, that we would be able to, to, to challenge maybe things that we've been taught our whole life, um, things that might go against the grain, that we might be able to just to, to look at those things and make sure that we understand, we know, excuse me, why we believe what we believe. And um, it's so critical for us to be rooted down and founded in your word in that we know exactly why we believe from, from your word, from the Bible, dear God. I pray that you please bless everyone that's here tonight. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hey,